everyone! Welcome to episode number 577 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. I am super happy to announce that longtime friend of the show, Elisa Fitzgerald, is my guest this week. Elisa and I are talking about MEMS product development. What sets AM Fitzgerald's innovation process apart from other MEMS companies, and why recent developments in thin film PZT MEMS chips are a game changer for the future of MEMS applications. Also this week, I check out a strange new metafluid developed at Harvard University that can be programmed to change properties. But first, please welcome Elisa to Fish Fry. Hi, Elisa. Thank you so much for joining me. It's great to talk with you again, Amelia. So first off, Elisa, for my audience who may not know, what is AM Fitzgerald all about? So we are a MEMS product development company. And what that means is we work with clients who are trying to put MEMS sensor actuator technology into their existing products or into their next generation products. And they're usually doing that to try to gain some competitive advantage. We help them by designing either a custom MEMS chip for them that's based on existing well-known technology like pressure sensing, motion sensing, et cetera, or we help them innovate an emerging technology, which might be their idea, it might be something they're licensing, it might be something they ask us to invent, in which case we create an entirely new chip. We do design, we do process integration, we do prototyping of the new design to validate the design we've created by using university fabs. So our engineers will go to the fab and fabricate wafers for our customers to sample the chip design. And then once we're satisfied with the design, we work with foundries around the world to transfer the technology and set up a supply chain. Excellent. Now, I'm really interested by your innovation process. Tell me more about that. Yeah, that's something that we've been perfecting for the last 20 years. And as one of our folks likes to joke, we're really good at doing what's never been done before. To describe the process maybe more broadly, we really focus on practical, manufacturable outcomes for our customers. All of our customers need to get this thing made at the right price for their product and their business model. So our innovation process is not just about engineering. It's also about the holistic needs of the MEMS sensor or actuator to make it work in the product. So in the innovation stage, we look at not only multi-physics modeling to determine, you know, is the sensor or actuator going to work the way we want it to, but we also look at cost modeling. We look at package interface. We look at electronics interface. For medical devices, we have to look at biocompatibility and sterilization. So we try to front load understanding exactly what this device is going to need to do in its product or its end-use application and make sure we're taking all of that into account in the innovation process. And I think that's really different. I think a lot of folks who design MEMS, they focus only on the front end silicon and getting the device to work and they kind of kick the can down the road on everything else. But usually what that means is you'll end up redesigning at some point when you realize, oh, you know, I forgot about my interface requirement or I didn't consider packaging requirements, etc. That makes sense. Now, you guys recently formed an alliance with MEMS Infinity to speed up the commercialization of piezoelectric MEMS products. So before we dig into the details here, talk to me about thin film PZT MEMS chip technologies. What do you think are the benefits here and what kind of applications would benefit the most from these technologies? Yeah, so PZT is a pretty amazing material. It's been around actually since the 1950s in bulk format. And we actually are encountering it in all aspects of our lives right now. You know, if you've got a gas powered car, it's in your spark plugs. Most cars these days have backup sensors in the bumpers. That's all bulk PZT ultrasound sensors. Your igniters on your gas stovetop in your kitchen might be made from bulk PZT. So the material itself is fantastic as a bulk piezoelectric material. It's been really fantastic. And what's happened in the last couple of decades is people have figured out how to make that material, which used to come in chunks and you would saw and machine, 
how to make that material in a thin film setting where you're depositing it uniformly onto a wafer at one micron thickness, two micron thickness, et cetera. And by being able to take this incredible material and deposit it as a thin film, you're now enabling to get that piezoelectric transduction, which for the audience who may not be familiar with these materials means that this is a material that if you put a voltage into it or a charge into it, it will change its mechanical shape. And likewise, if you press on it or stretch it, if you change its mechanical shape, it will move charge, it will have a different voltage that comes out of it. So it is itself a transducer. And this is the property that we're leveraging in MEMS. So what's great about that is you can now take this functionality, which is previously only available at the macro scale and get it on the micro scale. And that enables us to pack a lot of punch into a very tiny area. So a piezoelectric MEMS device, you can think of it as a new architecture. A lot of existing MEMS devices that are commercially available on the market, they are based on the 1990s capacitive comb drive finger architecture that needed really excellent deep silicon etch in order to fabricate, to manufacture, and had some limitations, right, because of the past limitations of the geometry, et cetera. So now we can get some of that same functionality, but in a different architecture using a piezo film, the piezoelectrical properties as the transducer. So it's great as an actuator. It's great as what's called a transceiver, something that both sends and receives. So in that respect, there's a lot of great ultrasound applications. And by the way, PZT is already used in your doctor's office in the ultrasound wands, but in the bulk format. So what people are looking at and doing is how to use it in a micro scale format, also for ultrasound medical imaging, ranging, gesture recognition, et cetera. So to come back to your original question, it's a material and a transducer type you can think of that has a lot of possible embodiments and applications. And I think a lot of old style capacitive MEMS will eventually be reimagined in this new architecture. Okay. So Elisa, tell me more about this alliance with MEMS Infinity. Yeah, we are really excited about this. So MEMS Infinity is a new division within Sumitomo Precision Products, which is a Japanese company that has been around for almost 60 years. They have been involved in MEMS as both a tool maker and a device maker for 30 years now. And they're well known for their piezoelectric gyroscope, which they sell under the Silicon Sensing Systems brand. So they have been pioneers in thin film PZT for more than 20 years. They have production stable material and we're excited about the Alliance because we will get access to this high performing PZT film that's like I said, it's production stable. It's used in their current products that they're manufacturing and we'll get access to that in the early design stage. As designers, that's really important to us because as I said earlier, the material is the transducer itself. So if you're trying to design a product, you want to be working in the design stages with the material that you're going to manufacture on. You don't want to be working on like an R&D sol gel or some kind of unstable material. So we're excited that the Alliance is going to help AM Fitzgerald and our customers to get access to the super high quality, high performing material in the development stages. And then there'll also be a pathway to fabrication to mass production is needed. MEMS Infinity is a 20,000 square foot foundry. They have a six inch line, they have an eight inch line, so they can support volume manufacturing when the time comes. So in total, the Alliance is gonna help both of the parties come together to give the customers a really integrated product development experience. Fantastic. All right. So you wrote a book called MEMS Product Development from Concept to Commercialization, Microsystems and Nanosystems. So tell my audience a little bit about this book and what they can learn by reading it. So myself and, and my co-authors, Carolyn White and Charles Chung, in the course of doing business at AM Fitzgerald, we have spent a lot of time advising our clients on the journey of MEMS product development and teaching them what to expect, et cetera. A lot of our clients come from outside the silicon and semiconductor space, and they don't know a lot about how wafer production works and the economics of making a silicon-based device. You know, and this is, for example, particularly true with medical device companies who are very eager to use the technology, but don't really know too much about the whole world of wafers. So we found that we were having the same conversation over and over and over again with all of our different clients. And finally, we decided we got to write this stuff down because we think it's broadly useful. And, and what we aim to do in the book is create a guidebook. And we often use the analogy of 
climbing a mountain or going on a journey through the wilderness. If you're not an experienced wilderness person, you want a guide. And so the book is trying to help be that guidebook for you and to help you understand, especially if you're not familiar with MEMS or you're not familiar with the space, what are things that you have to look out for? What are things that you have to anticipate? And our goal is really to help companies have a great experience with MEMS product development and know what they need to know. And particularly one thing we emphasize a lot is to make sure they raise enough money or gather enough budget within their organization to do a good job of it. So it's out there. You can think of it as a guidebook to developing MEMS. And of course, if you're going to climb the Everest of MEMS, we want to be your guides. <laughs> I love it. All right, Elisa, it is time for your off the cuff. Now, the last time you were on my show, which was a couple years ago now, you played hockey in your free time. So Elisa, do you still play? I still play. You know, I'm, I'm getting up there in years, but, you know, it's a great sport and it's something that you can play into your later adulthood. I enjoy it so much. It helps keep me sane because it's still the best workout I've ever seen. And I get to play with a lot of really fun people in the Bay Area. So, yeah, it keeps me young. And, you know, I think those in the audience who are hockey players will know exactly what I'm talking about. You can't give it up, really. <laughs> I love it. Well, Elisa, thank you so much for coming back on my show. I really appreciate speaking with you. It's my pleasure, Amelia. And congratulations on such a long run with the fish fry. I'm, I was realizing recently that, you know, podcasting is very popular now. You were doing it way before it became this popular. So congratulations to you. Thank you. Did you hear about Harvard's new metafluid? This strange new fluid can not only change its transparency, but also its compressibility and whether it's Newtonian or not. Okay, let's step back a bit. Metamaterials are artificially engineered materials whose properties are determined by their structure rather than composition. Metamaterials aren't really anything new, really. They've been around for a while and have been widely used in a range of applications for years. But this new metafluid, created by a team of researchers at Harvard University, is something entirely new. This first-of-its-kind metafluid uses a suspension of small elastomer spheres that are somewhere between 50 and 500 microns. These spheres actually buckle under pressure, which can radically change the characteristics of the fluid. So, how did this team develop this new metafluid? It's super cool. Using a scalable fabrication technique developed in a lab at SEAS, the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, this team was able to produce hundreds of thousands of these air-filled spherical capsules. And then they suspended them in silicon oil. When the pressure inside the liquid increases, the capsules collapse, forming a lens-like half-sphere. When that pressure is removed, the capsules pop back into their spherical shape. And it's in this transition that allows changes in the properties of the liquid. And those properties can be tuned by altering the thickness, size, or number of capsules in the liquid. This team was able to demonstrate this unique programmability by loading it into a hydraulic robotic gripper and having that gripper pick up an egg, a blueberry, and even a glass bottle. Now, in a traditional hydraulic system powered by air or water, the robot would need some kind of external control or sensing to be able to adjust that grip and pick up all three different objects without crushing them. But with this new metafluid, no sensing is needed. Since the liquid adjusts to different pressures, it can adjust the force of the gripper to be able to pick up all of those things without any additional programming. Even further, this new metafluid can also change its optical properties as well. 
So when the capsules in this metafluid are round, the liquid appears to be opaque because those capsules scatter the light. But when pressure is applied, those capsules collapse. And when they do that, they behave like micro lenses that instead focus the light and make the liquid transparent. And even further, this new metafluid can also switch between a Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluid as well. So when these little capsules are in their spherical shape, the fluid is Newtonian, meaning its viscosity only changes with temperature, like water. But when these spheres collapse, the fluid becomes non-Newtonian, meaning it changes viscosity in response to sheer force. Think tomato sauce. So what kind of applications are we looking at with this new metafluid? Quite a few. It could be used in everything from hydraulic actuators to program robots to intelligent shock absorbers that can dissipate energy depending on the intensity of the impact to optical devices that can transition from clear to opaque and even logic gates that open up liquid computers. Katia Bertoldi, senior author of this study, sums up their research like this. She says, Unlike solid metamaterials, metafluids have the unique ability to flow and adapt to the shape of their container. Our goal was to create a metafluid that not only possesses these remarkable attributes, but also provides a platform for programmable viscosity, compressibility, and optical properties. In the future, this team also plans on investigating thermodynamic and acoustic properties of this metafluid as well. <laughs> Super cool, right? So if you want more information about this new metafluid developed at SEAS at Harvard, or more information about A.M. Fitzgerald's groundbreaking work in MEMS Innovation, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I understand. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. And make sure you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some super exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or, heck, you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of April 12th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.